Hi there, everybody. This is Carson Gruba. Hi, I'm Sean Robinson. We're living a line, and today we're going to be talking about something fairly entertaining. I th I hope. Uh, hopefully, it's always entertaining. But uh, today, uh, this is the first video of us taking a deep dive into the long-standing comic Cerebus. 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 <laughs> uh, what do you know about the origins of uh, Cerebus, Carson? Dave Sim did it in the late 70s. <laughs> I don't know. I've read the, like, why and aardvark and all that. I, I don't know. I don't really. I don't know. Probably too much, but it, it, I don't know. It doesn't strike me as interesting. I'm curious why you're asking. <laughs> um, I guess the reason uh, I was asking you uh, is uh, I wanted to talk about it. <laughs> oh okay yeah like that's what i'm like i don't know i mean dave like sat around and drew an aardvark so uh, yeah um, yeah what do you find interesting about it uh, i guess what i find interesting about it is um the origins that is is, is uh, basically that uh although you know i know you and i and Callion uh consider it to be one of the greatest works of art of that time you know of, of the past century and also um, a, a uniquely individual and self-expressionistic comic. I think it's very interesting that it started as a group exercise uh, in a certain way. So uh, Cerebus, the first issue, was uh, came out in 1977. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, did I say 77? 78, <laughs> right? 77. Uh, I'm not going to make reference to anything. Uh, it's possible I'll have minor uh you know minor accidents as we're, as we're talking here but um uh you know um, my apologies in advance Cerebus came out in 1977 uh and uh, like a lot of people know he was actually as a character was drawn as a mascot for a fan publication uh essentially like a zine that was going to be done by uh Dave's girlfriend at the time Denny Lubert and uh Denny's brother, Michael Lubert, who was a uh, who was a fantasy writer, and so they had this zine that they were working on. Uh, it had Denny's poetry. It had some different pieces by different people, and Dave, the boyfriend, uh, was going to be the illustrator. And uh, Dave, the boyfriend, uh, made this little logo for this zine. And uh, after they put this this uh, zine together and uh they found a printer who uh they you know advertised in the back of a comic or something like that and they mailed this entire zine off to this printer and they never heard from the person ever again <laughs> <laughs> that's frustrating <laughs> never saw the zine you know it was never in print all the artwork disappeared uh wow. but david kept a photo stat of this little uh character that he had made as the logo for um for their for their uh, zine called Cerebus, which was a misspelling of Cerberus, and uh, at some point Dave was like, "Well, I, he'd already drawn the logo." Uh, he was like, "Well, uh, maybe it's not a misspelling. Maybe that's the name of the little guy that I drew for the uh, for the logo." Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, this so this let me let me interrupt yeah. before we get too far. Um, that means someone potentially has that original piece of artwork. Potentially, yeah. It depends on how much of a scheme you think uh, this uh, publishing racket was. Well, I don't uh, think they were like trying to get his artwork, but that would be a hell of a thing to realize that Grandpa never sent the uh, sent the artwork back to the guy, and you're like rummaging through the attic, and you're like, "Wow, this is the first drawing ever of this character." You know, I mean. That would be a hell of a find. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Stuff always comes up from this time period. I mean, uh, somebody recently posted uh, a few images uh, from you know 1976 that Dave had drawn uh, that had never been published anywhere, uh, and uh, you know they were in Harry Kramer's basement or whatever. And yeah. when his estate was liquidated, um, you know, one of his employees bought him. Um, and um, but uh, yeah, in this case, I think that it was probably some type of scam. Uh, where they were just collecting people's money remotely and then they shut it down when they had collected a certain amount. So I would bet that they got, you know, ended up in a dumpster somewhere. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's not just the original art for this logo. It's everything that they did for that. Um, and Dave has a few pieces here and there 
that had been photostated that give you an idea of what it was that uh, they had done. But yeah, you know, they put together like a fanzine essentially, or a zine uh, that had poetry and little pieces and things like that. Um, but interestingly enough to me, that sort of attitude of collaboration, it, it's hard to view it now if you're just thinking about Cerebus as this monumental 26 year achievement uh, that expresses an individual thinking through all these different things. Because I think especially the early issues, you don't really just have an individual thinking through these things. You have an individual pushing against these other individuals and you have this sort of like clubhouse mentality that's infused with the early issues. Yeah, and I know uh, Denny's brother was writing kind of like there would be pieces in the back that are like the history of the land right. where it's it's like the guy writing the D&D <laughs> like yeah. little in info book. Um that, that some of the world building was done by Michael LeBaire. Right. And, and Michael LeBaire uh, drew the map or uh, designed the map of the world, uh, which actually, you know, as we go through the series, you'll see that it recurs over and over again. I mean, Dave followed it to a certain extent throughout uh, the time of the series. And, uh, you know, he mined all of that information that are in those first few um I, I forgot exactly what the what the column was called. We'll, we'll hit it when we see the issue, but uh, the, the little text pieces that Michael LeBaire wrote, and I think that that is a sort of untalked about component to these early issues. Uh, in fact, uh, somebody who um, I, Dave didn't verify this to me personally, but I put it in an essay that somebody else said it, and he didn't correct it. Uh, uh, somebody who was a friend of his at the time uh, said in a in a comment. Uh, you know, written a few years ago that Elrod was an in-joke uh, among their group of friends that he was a specific person that they knew that not not just the, you know, speech patterns of uh, Foghorn Leghorn or whatever, um, but a specific, his attitude towards the world and the way that he interacted with other people and how other people sort of just, you know, shut off. This was a guy that they knew and that mm. everybody in the in-group knew that this was a specific person that he was like <laughs> interesting know. there's a lot of that in there if you know like when you know there, there's certain things that i've seen in there like knowing that dave is making a joke that only like him and a couple people would get right and uh yeah i think that that's sort of important to think about when we're looking at these first few issues is what what the sort of magic formula was for uh, putting all these things together. You know, when, when Dave talks about like lightning in a bottle and uh, you know, you only get a character like this once. I mean, I think part of that is that you're only young enough to think that somebody wants to read <laughs> your yeah. crazy thing once. Right. Yeah. And you're young yeah. and you're in your early twenties and you're in love for the first time or whatever. You're in lust satisfactorily for the first time. Uh, however, uh, somebody wants to look at it you're you know you have this sort of vision that enables you to just take things you know and and i think dave is a person who was from the very early age invested in comics in a real um thorough kind of way that enabled him to sort of see the medium as a on all the unmarked territory there and the territory that he staked out is essentially like a combination of all of these different things that have been hinted at by other works but never really explored you've got in these first few issues here, you've basically got Barry Windsor Smith's Red Nails, period, Conan. And you have Howard the Duck. Mm -hmm. And you have <laughs> fanzine culture. And all of these things are on a collision course with each other. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's like a summation of everything that was a distillation of everything that was in the air at the time. But we talked about that with Callion that that seems to be the strength of Cerebus throughout is that he distills people kind of write it off as parody, but through the parody, he's constantly squeezing the juice out of everything else and condensing it into like one statement. And I think that takes, it, it, it makes it uh, a meta myth. It's, it's like the distillation of all of the zeitgeist. And, right. and that's, I think, what got him into trouble eventually, um, you know, but that's, to me, part of the power of the book and maybe why it's like 
you know, Callion saying, well, it's the greatest like piece of art of the 20th century is it, it is the distilled kind of 20th century um, mythology, like all condensed into one kind of summation that I think you could extract a lot of meaning out of in the end. Right. Uh, even something like this very first page. And yes, this is an original copy of service number one. And yes, I'm holding it up in the air with no gloves on. Yes, Damn, probably. you terrible collector. You, It's not even stapled, right? It doesn't look like. Oh, uh, yeah. There's a story behind this. Maybe we should save that for the for that when we page through this. But this very first page, um, you know, we call it, whether it's a parody or not, uh, this page is a loving tribute to a specific Barry Windsor Smith splash page from the time mm -hmm. period that I'm talking about. And uh, maybe we can pop those uh, side by side when we uh, edit the video. But yeah, the, for sure. It, it's, it's not just a parody. It is an attempt to work out the style that Barry Windsor Smith was working in at the time. Um, this is not a simple parody. This is somebody attempting to teach themselves how to draw like the person that they are imitating. Yeah, um, which he, I mean, he, he's still doing all the way up through Strange Death of Alex Raymond. That, to me, is Dave's biggest M.O., is um, Mockingbird... And in the Mockingbird is where he derives meaning. And, right. and there's a, a comedic spin on everything that's easy to pass off as parody. But I think he's looking for like, like why is this powerful? It's yeah. not just the parody. It, it's when you, po when you look for something that serious. that Because, I mean, and he says it's a quest for truth. And, and that, that's how I have to view the book. Um, like you have to take it with a grain of salt maybe and maybe the reason why people don't like the later stuff is there's less of a grain of salt in, hmm. in there you know like if you're talking about subjects that big but yeah I think he's looking for why is this stuff so popular right now why is this so powerful like when I'm learning this style what's embedded in it and what can I extract out of that? And then combine that with what I've extracted out of all of these other things. And then I'll get the, the like the insanely powerful thing. And, and I think it mostly works. It, it, I don't think it's any coincidence that, um, you know, when he brings in Red Sonia for the first time in issue three. <clears throat> so on one hand, it's a devastating parody of the chainmail bikini. Uh, yeah, we'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, save that for that. <laughs> right. But, but, um, so you have this parody that's so thorough that basically like it demolishes any potential uh, use of the character in a serious nature beyond there. On yeah. the other hand, the guy who was drawing the character wrote to him and said, Oh my God, this great thing that you did. Like, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's uh, hey, may I please draw a cover of your. <laughs> yeah. Cause like you understood what I did like right. so thoroughly and that, that continues out through the whole. The whole thing. So can, let's go yeah, ahead and just let's flip through. We're gonna flip through the first two issues. So I'm there. There's a couple things that I I want to say before we start looking at it. Um, one is I'm glad we're looking at the actual issues instead of the reprints because I think that kind of stuff you're talking about with with uh, Denny's brother writing the the stuff in the back and just the ads that that's part of how I think. You, the audience can best understand Cerebus. I think getting it in the trades is good. You read it just as the story, but for my understanding of what really makes the book great, uh, you got to see them in the original format. Second off, I'm really glad that we're starting with issue one because a lot of times when people talk about introducing someone to Cerebus, they say, well, give them high society or give them Jocka's story or something like that. Um, like and even in the 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 trade paperback I have here, Dave says these are these are the first tentative steps, unburdened by in editorial interference. It was a wonderful time. My hair was much longer, um, but I hope the dedication of the rookie shows, you know. And and there's a lot of people that are kind of dismissive of this first volume, um, but I think if people you know like when we're flipping through, through this book even though the polish of his draftsmanship isn't what it is later on his power as a as a comics creator is 
full bore right out the gate. I mean, he is a wonderful, powerful comic artist right away. And was immediately doing things that were not, uh, you know, <clears throat> not really well-known uh, techniques. I think some of that has to do with his friendship with Gene Day and the two of them really just going nuts with, you know, discussing layouts and talking and things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm putting too much emphasis on that, but. Well, uh, no, so I mean, I think Dave admits that. And you see that in Gene Day's work too. He was, he was an, a formal, he, he was a innovative. formalist. He liked experimenting. Yeah. And Dave is a powerful storyteller and a powerful formalist, like from page one. Um, right. And that, that never changes. And you see a lot of his tricks in page one. And I think that you're talking about this, like, you know, he's in love or in lust for the first time and everything's going well and he's got his group and he's the young man like forging his own way and that's that's the first volume for me is this powerful young artist like forging out into the world and that's kind of what the stories are is this powerful young warrior forging out into the world and right uh we, we should uh, note that um uh, i restored the first volume uh, painstakingly, I think uh, is a safe word to use uh, for that restoration. Um, and uh, the the restored trade is stunning. It uh, was printed in something like 2016. No, uh, 2017. Uh, 18. Let's <laughs> we'll yeah. put a link to it in the uh, in the show notes. But um, it's stunning. Uh, but uh, you have never seen this unless you have either seen the original issues or seen it from the restored trade, uh, because uh, the Dave had this printed by the local newspaper press, basically this, this company that did the local newspapers mm. and they either didn't keep the negatives or when he switched to another press, they recycled them, destroyed them. This was um, a common thing at the time. You'd recycle all the acetate uh, or you'd charge the people more to keep them. And anyway, I have never seen a reprint of Cerebus number one that actually went back to the original negative. If I had had mm. the original negative to work from, I mean, who knows what it would have looked like, but uh, I actually worked from this particular print copy right here. So when you see a restored 2018 Cerebus Volume 1 trade and you look at it and say that stunning artwork, all of it was scanned from this book, this mm. exact old physical book. Uh, this was Denny LeBaire's office copy of the book. And so it actually has her handwriting throughout the whole thing. Damn, and Sean. These. And you got it out of the package and you're just <laughs> fingerprints all over it. <laughs> You can see these numbers right here. Uh, wow. These page numbers are, um, you know, probably they use this to indicate like what the trade was going to be. What What's um, that? It looks like the back is is bleeding through to the front on the back cover there. Yeah. Like it got so stapled there, offset. Uh, yeah. This there was an issue with um, how the, the cover was uh, set up. And uh, basically the dimensions of the book were wrong. And the guy that had been... Um, that the that the printer had uh, sent out the covers to suggested a fix so that they wouldn't have to reprint anything. And the fix uh, was basically mm -hmm. like having the bleed be offset and having the stable be offset and everything like that. So it's it's an interesting uh, thing. And you can see Dave actually did these red hand separations himself uh, and just took a drawing board and you know put it on his light board or whatever, or a, a piece of drawing board artboard, put it on his light board and uh, did all of the areas by hand where he wanted the red to appear. And that includes like putting screen tone here and things like that. And, you know, overlapping red screen tone with the black. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, um, it's a very interesting artifact of its time, even from a production standpoint, this was not done. Like he didn't send this out to be color separated by a professional. He just used two artboards <laughs> And uh, but, yeah. his cover was drawn at almost 100% uh, size to the original artwork. Um, okay, cool. So rather than doing this on a very large piece, he just flipped a regular artboard around and drew one half of the cover on one side and one half on the other side. Um, that's that's a, that someone just making it work. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this is like I said, this is you know somebody in their early 20s uh, just trying out what it is that they want to do. Okay, but and, right out the gate, look at the power of his compositions, his spotting of blacks, like his use of silhouette, um, the, just having the, the shadow in the first two with the, like being ominous and demonic looking and then the reveal of the goofy character. 
like all of that is already a master of the form uh and his and rendering's a bit goofy because he's trying to rip off barry windsor smith but he's great interestingly enough the very first figure that appears here appears to be referenced from dave himself this looks like a fairly goony drawing of uh, dave at the time the book was made and much buffer <laughs> <laughs> so literally the first figure that you see is a self-portrait yeah that makes sense i don't know if i've ever seen anybody else reference that but uh, it was it was interesting to me to look at it and notice that when i say self-portrait i mean he probably just referenced himself in the mirror when he was drawing it yeah it, now that you pointed out, it does look like so he does he does appear in the book way earlier <laughs> than when he actually <laughs> inserts himself. Um, so the, even on the inside there, you get the like note from the publisher, and that's that continues throughout like the whole series. At first, it's Denny, Dave's girlfriend, or at, which the, were they were married at this point? They were married. At no, this point. no. Um, and then Dave takes over. So those yeah. notes also are part of the content of the experience of reading the book for me right and how yep. he when he's on a quest for truth a lot of it happens through there and in the letter columns right and yeah this one is note from the publisher and then when dave takes over he gives himself a new title the president yeah of course <laughs> as, as befits his uh, interest in democracy at the time and uh, yeah politics. exactly and that's why i think the the back matter and front matter sync up with the story always in an interesting way and then and look at this, look at the design and the chopping up of the panels with those sh shadows, the, the rhythmic qualities of that. Uh, the overlaid shadows wrapping around the uh, figures here. Yeah, and, and then the, the combination of words and pictures um, so that they're, they're always cross informing each other. They're never like, like doubling up the information, the focus right. on lettering like with that that hack that the lettering is a picture in and of itself you know right. uh, that that's all there out the gate yeah um you're you're you're, in, you're very much uh right about the tension between the word balloons and the images that they they're giving cross information yeah uh, can you and, read that middle tier right there yeah it was tenkat thal who decided to begin services education in manners hack Needless to say, the remainder of the Aardvark's journey was uneventful. Yeah, like th those, those have to go together like that. So th they're all necessary components. And then you get over to the other page. And when I was flipping through it right before we did this, I noticed, wow, that's, that's Pud behind his bar. Like that. Um, right. Like the, the world's like so fully realized already. Or, or the he just goes back to the kernels of it so much that it feels realized later on. Yeah, this like this silhouette is straight out of high society, you know, 25 issues later. And super and sophisticated later. design and use of negative space and stuff. So mm -hmm. you um, can tell I that think... he... No, go ahead. Good. I think if you're going to read Cerebus, start at the beginning. It's a damn good book straight from issue one. Well, the, the thing is, uh, I, I think part of the reputation for crudity has to do with the fact that it was never printed again from the original negative. So mm. it, you look how clean this looks. This is an original printing. People aren't cracking open their $1,000 copy of uh, Service Number 1 to read it. So unless you've read the remastered trade, uh, you haven't seen the artwork look like this. Yeah. So the the edition that you have over at your, at, you know, your computer right now is awful. just absolutely heinous and and you're yeah. talking multi-generations down so somebody at the printer when they decided they were going to reprint this shot this page uh and then printed from that on newsprint yeah and i have <clears throat> what is it the 10th printing in 2001 yeah so yeah that's yeah. that's <laughs> that's how many generations down the one i've got is and it got worse from there uh when they when they transferred them to to digital but uh, yeah, I mean, the 2018 printing, uh, which hopefully we'll look at, you know, when we're looking at like issue four or five, probably. Um, yeah, so I've, I've got a copy on the way. So we'll okay, I'll be able to video that from here on out. But I do like that you have and hopefully we'll be able to go look at the back matter and stuff in your original issues, too. Yeah. Um, look, look again on the upper right there where 
he's got that super abstract like shadow coming together but but they make Cerebus but it's the shadow it's the shadows of the two guys following Cerebus and Cerebus's feet that are making that shadow uh but it's this really yeah interesting blobs at first and it forms together to make another like demonic Cerebus like that's super sophisticated stuff also interesting um from an efficiency standpoint he's given himself a monster to draw that just involves him filling in solid black and that's a trick dave uses all throughout is strong use of like black and cerebus being in it, it a it's visually appealing and b it's yeah he's trying to do this on a regular schedule all by himself um so he creates efficiency tricks right. throughout that that then become part of his identifiable style right and and in fact uh this this is probably responsible for the monster uh being yeah. all black right <laughs> yeah he here. spent too much time on the barry windsor smith leaves <laughs> exactly right this is this is the uh this is what that is making up for so he spent too much time on this he spent too much time figuring out where his horizon line is supposed to be yeah. on this upper shot right here and then he's making up for it by turning this into a shadow monster that you don't see any detail on but it never seems like a cheat. It actually, no. it creates the language of what makes Cerebus so powerful. Right. Uh, so smart. Uh, and then there's that, that statue there almost looks like a Frank Miller drawing to me. Yeah, not necessarily Frank Miller of 1977, uh, but, uh, you know, Frank Miller of 1981 yeah. or 1982 or 1983. I think both of them are getting this high contrast rendering from you know some of the superhero comics that were popular at the time or also maybe from you know milk caniff yeah it doesn't seem like a very windsor smith knockoff though like that seems like its own thing there where like dave's instinct took over he, also his neil adams interests i think probably right and interestingly enough you could see if you were to talk to him about this i mean he would just probably be able to go on and on about one particular page and what he's seeing in that page. And, uh, yeah. you know, he, he's got an amazing visual recollection. Um, I saw, I sent him by fax an image that he drew in 1976 that had never been published, that he had sold immediately and never seen since then. And he knew that it was uh, referenced from a Playboy. <laughs> wow. That he had seen at the time. Yeah, he and he's so intentional with everything he does, and he can explain to you still what his intention was, and and I always get the impression that that's not changed. <laughs> that right. that is what his original intention was. Look at all those like strong, just like figuring out of how the shadows would fall, but also the design elements of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that super cool old old school Dungeons and Dragons zombie skeleton. Right. Yeah, this uh, so, is this is one of the um best drawn figures in the book, I'd say. Yeah, and and, and probably because he had a reference for a skeleton <laughs> that right. he could manipulate. And, the, and then then the negative spaces that's created throughout that entire scene is they're, they're all beautiful. White movement lines, very yeah. interesting choice there. Uh the few pictures I've seen of of um original art from this issue would indicate that there was a lot more white highlights. Uh, that didn't mm-hmm. make it to print. Anything that did make it to print, I was able to recover fairly well uh, from the print scans. But um, uh, occasionally pages have come up on Heritage and I was able to use photos of those pages like this one. Um, if you've to, got pages, contact Sean so they can be scanned. Yes, any any original art uh, that is scanned uh, for any issue of service will eventually make it into these uh, restorations. But uh, yeah, I've seen some original art photos of a page like this and there's you know, white highlights and white drawing in that he, you know, the fairly perfunctory uh, work that the printer did in shooting his negatives doesn't always mean that the white came through. Mm. Um, and he was definitely in the process of figuring out what it was that was going to happen. And this is an interesting use of this already. The very first issue, this is a move that he became known for later. Yeah, Having, animating across the space, but break, and it, it happens in the upper left too as Cerebus backs up. That's right. that like Tezuka <laughs> animated stuff. Yeah, that, 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 those two pages are like Dave Sim comic storytelling language 101. And it's not like he's the only one that did it, 
but there's something about the way he does it that's very particular to him. Um, yeah, there's a I, there's a lot more like interest in spacing. I'm I'm actually very curious if someone can uh, tell me the earliest instance that they've found of a comic artist using this technique of movement uh, through the gutters. I found it once earlier than this uh, in a children's book, uh, but I actually asked Dave about whether he had read that children's book and he said no. Um, there's a book called Calico the Wonder Horse uh, that was done by one of the greatest uh, uh, children's authors of the past century. Uh, the same person who drew, uh, she she wrote and drew Mike Mulgan and the Steam Shovel and a few other things like that. In fact, we'll take a look at Calico the Wonder Horse at the end of this here, just real quick. Well, I um, mean, but even if you go back to like uh, Frank King on Gasoline Alley, his Sundays would have like a stable image that the characters moved around on top of. Uh, broken right. up in the panels so it's it's not like no one's ever done that trick but i think part of it's because he tends to do it over black uh there oftentimes there's something about that that makes it it, it again you know i can always come back to rhythm in this channel but it's really rhythmic the way he does it yeah the frank king sundays it's a good call uh i guess i guess when I, i'm not interested necessarily who invented this but where did he get it from? Where did he get it from? Yeah, Who look at that. This is speaking of old. This is this is uh, old Windsor McKay, mm -hmm. like distort. This is what I'm saying. Like this is issue one, and you're getting stuff like this, and then the 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 the, the dis, like just the drawing of the distortions is crazy. But then on the page on the right, even though it's five different drawings, they actually all kind of line up to the same fisheye lens like the right. the circles persist throughout them even though each one's being warped in a different way as well like that's nuts yeah this right here are almost part of the same warp and, and you get that in strange death of alex raymond the the that like uh i call it the sim sizzle instead of the kirby crackle all that like stars blowing up through space that cross over two panels like he had that in I, issue one, and it, it still looks fresh when he's doing it now. I don't know about you, but this is, <laughs> that would be intimidating as hell to me to work out a face and then be like, okay, now I'm going to cover half of it with black. <laughs> yeah, and it looks great, and, and it's all design decisions. That's the thing that he's such a great designer, I, I think, that it didn't really matter what his skill, I mean, he's obviously a great draftsman to pull off those just those anamorphic distortions too right. but he's such a damn good designer always has been you know one, one of the things that um uh you know uh, is a maxim of his that i think is one of the things that is one of the most valuable things if he ever said is first you get um good wait first you get good then you get fast then you get good and fast yeah Hey, actually, can you go uh, and, back to, sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, I, I like to think about that in, in um, relationship to this right here, because I've seen pages that he drew a year before this, that the drawing is much, much better. The reason mm. that the drawing is weak sometimes on this is because he's going fast for the first time. Um, he had already gotten good. I mean, obviously, like a, the formal trickery and everything like that. Um, but what he hadn't gotten is good and fast. What you see over the first 50 issues of service is not him getting better. It's him getting better while being fast. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, something like this, in terms of the drawing, I mean, is as good, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know. You, you, if you pick out individual panels, those individual panels can be extremely, really good. And then it's the off-model ones that like, make you go, uh. Oh, this is a little more amateurish or, you know, the hand right here or something like that. You go, Oh, he still can't draw amateurish. hands though. <laughs> yeah. That's he still draws fingers like that. Like that's just, he's even said that somewhere like, Oh, you know, Dave Sim's going to draw Dave Sim hands. Uh, that's, that's a, that's a quote from Gene day. Uh, when he was working on something oh, okay. in 1976, uh, yeah. he showed Gene day an illustration and, and he said, hand still not right. And Gene day looked at it and he said, that's a Dave Sim hand. And then he went back uh, to working. You go look at Strange Death of Alex Raymond, have these these 
photorealistic things and then those sausage fingers still <laughs> i don't know what it is can you go back to the page with the what i said look like a frank miller thing yeah um there was there's actually a note i made there that i wanted to point out um that it, talking about the world building uh they already it looks like a spelling error but he says terim t-e-r-i-m and then the next panel he curses terim t-a-r-i-m uh, right and that looks like a spelling error but that actually i don't know if that was a spelling error and then they just made an excuse he for it later erased on. it yeah he embraced it was a spelling error okay. the error that made it in print that's right Okay, because and, that is a very important part of the mythology of the world is the masculine and the feminine uh, variations on the name of that god, Terum, yeah. right? Terum and Terum, yeah. And, and the thing is, uh, that, that is actually an incredibly good illustration of what made this series tick, is an embrace of, uh, an embrace of accident as as a functional means of moving forward um yeah and then you know. that that set up like pretty much the whole structure of the rest of the book is the masculine first half and feminine second half in his mind right uh, you know and like that as part of the meta mythology of looking at i mean we'll get into that later but yeah looking at the 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 way human beings until that point had mythologized the masculine and the feminine. So I, I wanted to make sure we didn't go, skip over that because it's such an important seed. And that's what, you know, right. like five pages in, six pages in or something. Hey, Carson, we're going to pause just yeah. for a second while I go into the door. Okay. 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 Sorry about that. That's all good. Okay. So yeah, let's yeah let's the, keep... the embrace of of uh, of something that other people would think of as an error or something like that, and uh, you know if you think about it, like the entire series is founded on that. I mean, the, literally the name of the series is from a spelling error of yeah. a Greek god. I think uh, that's probably why he eventually moved. I, I don't know. He's always had a a mystical view of reality it just changes from a pagan mysticism to a monotheistic mysticism right but you can see why he'd say well that was something like kind of pointing me in the direction i needed to go in because these are things that like like he didn't plan they came to him th through those other kind of forced situations and then they they made the thing what it is and and, and made it the great thing it is right Look at that Batman cave <laughs> with the giant dinosaur. All rendered, by the way, with a lettering nib and a brush out of his mind. And, and so, again, that uh, animation across a flat sequence. Mm -hmm. um, but you can, and, you can see the lettering nib right here. Uh, so when I say lettering nib, what I mean is a flat nib. So the, the point, rather than being pointed like this, is, is flat on the end. And so he's using the side of the nib right here. And then when he turns the angle, he gets this thick line. So you get an idea from that line right there, how thick this yeah. nib he was using to letter this. And you know, Crazy. it's one of those things, there's no YouTube. The art store down the street doesn't necessarily have every, you know, nib cre of, of creation. You know, you can't order them on Amazon. You can't get a special order of, uh, you know, from Deleter or something like that. So you uh, just figuring out how to make you so some of the painted covers later on have that too where it's like what in the hell are you doing <laughs> yeah well um and, and, and uh, when he, he was visiting with uh somebody and they they looked at his original and said you're you're painting with this watercolor like it's gouache and he's like oh 
right? Yeah, that's it. He's take. We'll look at that when it happens. Also, yeah. look at that guy in the upper left. Look at the motion on his like shoulder turn. Yeah, and all yeah. the fabric is going. He's so sassy. Yep. Yeah, this is, it's all so good. Uh, this and is then the next is... page. Ooh. Yeah. Talk this about some Frank stuff. Miller, like where he must have been cribbing from a little bit. Yeah, I we I would I would be very intrigued to know what the the link is between them. I don't know if Dave was aware of Frank Miller's concurrent stuff. Yeah, but that dinosaur and then the dragon on the next page, th these predate the way Frank Miller was drawing right. this stuff in Sin City by a long time. So I right. find it hard to believe that Frank Miller wasn't looking at this. Yeah. Well, this this in particular, man, that right there. And it's funny that Dave poo poos his brushwork for, I don't even remember. He wrote the he wrote in 1993 um, that he basically used a brush like a mop. Uh, and you know he would he would mop with his brush, and that was basically all he would do with it. Well, this is a putting that to lie right there. Here's his mop. You look yeah, at these looks big, great. Yeah, it sure does. It did not look great after it was five generations down. It looked like a fucking mess. No, oh, it looks great uh, in the book I got too. It looks like a Frank Miller drawing. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I don't know. I, it's just, I think it's effective. It's really effective. And we've got these small little scribble doodles that also here. look like Frank Miller, those big chunky lines with then, like, I got a, a, a tech pen and then just scribbled within it. And right. the contrast between those two. Pretty great. The first appearance of the cosmic shit yeah quote unquote cosmic shit yeah which he's fantastic still, still does today very well better than anyone I, I would love to see this uh original art for this one and i wonder if there's more white hiding in there uh this is one of the only panels in this uh volume one restoration that i actually retoned uh got rid of the tone and replaced it uh he used a darker tone here not realizing it was going to fill in more than those lighter ones did and by the time you hit like the you know the on my copy it's black black yeah um yeah, we'll take a look at this nice. figure later when we do a video about the bootleg cerebus number one and yes there is a bootleg mm -hmm. cerebus number one teaser and, teaser and and it's uh sean has the answer of who did it <laughs> who made later the yeah who made revealed. the bootleg cerebus one uh, look at the animation at the bottom of that page again. And also yeah, look at right the here. the diagonal through uh, the top panel and the bottom two panels, even though he has twisted the viewpoint, um, mm -hmm. you know, he's rotated 90 degrees for the bottom two, that strong rhythmic repetition of that diagonal shadow. I think it's it's actually an object that's in silhouette, and then in the the bottom you see it, it the shadow it's casting, but the visual unity that creates the page is fucking genius. Come on, you can see the um that he'll later use this to great effect. But the, one of the first instances of super evocative background objects. You know, I've that... never noticed that weird face until you just pointed at it. That's oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it's a sort of, I don't know, African looking. I mean, it's got a sort of yeah. tribal mask. Look it's very it. different than anything else from him. This is another one where um, I, I actually got a photograph of the original artwork and was able to work from the photograph uh, for the restoration. But if you look at the 2018 volume one, you'll see that he had white tone across this. Um, oh, yeah, I can kind of see that. Barely to make like the smoke puff. Mm hmm. Oh, that's cool. There's yeah, a, I can other barely instances, see that. Other instances of white tone as well. That was in a particularly ineffective from a photographic standpoint uh, because the white film didn't have enough contrast mm -hmm. to preserve uh, the pr preserve the white through the photographic process. Um. So right here, he actually used white too. This is totally black, even on my copy it's got white in the mouth um i had a photograph of that page too that i was able to work from uh, oh, when i say work from i mean african. that i was basically what's that it's another african looking mask too yeah 
Okay. And look at those bottom two panels. Again, the action across a stable background split by the gutter. More of that kind of Frank Miller design. I mean, I, I'm saying Frank Miller because that's what we're more familiar <laughs> with. But this pre, this predates when Frank yes. Miller was working like this. So no, I'm just saying that because that's a com common yeah. reference. But and and notice the the um, the image being blotted out by these designy white highlights. Yeah, so and they have... sync up with the Art Nouveau elevator <laughs> upstairs there. Right. <laughs> Um, this is a very, very strong visual echo of the last Cerebus book, The Last Day, uh, where Cerebus has vision issues and the mm. outside of his view is whited out and it fades on the inside. So here we've got it. I mean, is this a purely designy element or are they just going outside? And this is like, this is essentially like a music transition. Well, what's happening is they defeat, yeah, they defeat the thing and the, the oh. whole tower that they're in is fading away, right? The right. all the shimmered illusion. and faded around them like a bad dream. Um, yeah, so yes. all of the stuff that's in the in the swirls is like the tower fading away. And it is musical. It looks like music notes or something, the, the mm -hmm. design of it. Yeah, so that's the illusion of it fading away. How, that, I mean, that's what I'm saying, like, this is issue one, and we're already how long in talking about it on amazing formal things on every page. Yeah, literally like, every page. Yeah, you got to start reading this series. And these are really entertaining episodes in these first series. They're funny. Yeah. They wrap up. They're, they're, they have the... And we're, we've been reading Berserk, and the further I get into Berserk, the more I notice similarities between the two. And we even had um, someone comment about what they saw as the similarities. I don't know. I don't think you've read ahead, but no. Berserk started out this same way, where it's just kind of like one story per thing. They're cool, uh, but you start setting up the world. Uh, and, and Dave did that intentionally. Like, you can't dump your entire world into issue one because if it never comes out again, you've bombed everyone out. Right. So he's very good at very pl pleasing single episode things. And it, it hooks you in. But it, it's got all of the world building in there. It's just casually thrown away. It's not like in your face, like, let me tell you all about Tarim and Tar Tarim. You know, right. it's, it's like oh, that yeah, comes later. See. You got to build your, you got to earn that stuff too. I right. see too many people who try and tell you all of that shit on the first three pages. And it's like, well, well I don't care now. The, this uh, gate here, this must be a Barry Windsor Smith motif or something, but he uses something very similar to this on top of um, one of the existing illustrations of Denny's poems for mm. the, uh, for the anthology that never was. And also comes back to it um, and at least one single ish or single page illustration. Do you think Dave was looking at stuff like Alphonse Mucha or was he getting it all from people in comics who were because I never hear Dave talk about artists that aren't comic artists. So do you think any of this is derived through it filtering through Barry Windsor Smith? Uh, I, I think that um, if, if you look at show posters from the time that Dave was a teenager, uh, yeah. you look at the early 70s uh, show posters and all of them are Musha uh, derived. Yeah, um, that's it's, true. It's practically like a, you know, North American house style. Yeah, I just <laughs> never my... hear him reference those uh, other artists. Uh, look at that last panel <laughs> on the bottom right. That's another Dave Sin hand. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and, and this, this dramatic, you know, lighting with the brow uh, in black, something that you would rarely see um, drawn, but he uses this to great effect pretty much throughout his yeah. career. And, and, and the, the cross panel tangent of the shadow on the grass into the tree up on the top two panels. Mm -hmm. uh, up, up, up. Like, oh, which one are you talking about? There's so many. Okay, the, from that this top, very top left panel on the right page. There's the shadow um, that goes behind. Yeah, right yeah. into there. That creates look, a lot of compelling movement. Yeah. I mean, this is like an arc that brings us into the, you know, 
yeah so impeccable design impeccable leading your eye through everything that happens on the next page too the horse the, <laughs> the horse snout things, goes into the trees there were things that uh, if you were looking at this from a modern eye you might not notice our innovations but uh, one of the things is you would not believe how many comics of this time period had almost exclusively anchored balloons like the oh. balloons are anchored up at the top of the page look at the way that he's used balloons here now that you know he's he's moved it down so that he has breathing room here and then it takes you directly there bringing you down and then we've got this arrow right here to hook you up these are not normal things for 1977 yeah it's part of the rhythm and the like the and not just rhythm in terms of boom 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 but like the flow up and down of the page um right. you even see that on the page over to there's a on the page on the left there's a strong in the top three panels a strong diagonal push up right like a triangle and the 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 word balloons are part of that diagonal push. right yeah they're, yeah, they're you just, read this and you know that you're going to read this next because he put a damn highlight there to tell you <laughs> yeah it's part of the design of the page it's not just something that gets slapped on afterwards which is a benefit of like hey you're the writer and the artist and the letter it's like it's all happening right as a, a cohesive whole i think that was that was different for the time too like uh that was mostly split off penciler inker writer mm -hmm. letter those are all separate jobs and dave's a master of every single one of those he's a great writer out the gate a great right. composer out of the gate he's a great storyteller out of the gate he's a great letterer out of the gate and then they congeal into a whole this is a an example of uh, the rendering that he was capable of doing even with his crude tools we get this you know walnut up close um but alas he's run out of time <laughs> but look at uh, again like the way the horse's nose straights a tangent down into the panel below it and then the the trees on the the bottom left and the middle panel create kind of a, a stable tree. image of a single tree even though you've totally flipped the view yeah yep even here as well to the to the ones that are in shadow yeah and it then, all links it together and then we have uh the splash page once again promising us more conan adventure here yeah and more frank miller <laughs> before i have another miller. term for that half yeah. and half it's it's ten high contrast by the way let me let me say this uh, Frank Miller's work, go, go back to that because this is a good example of it. It's something I've been chewing on for a long time. Frank Miller's work is always called chiaroscuro. People refer to his, <laughs> that is the fucking wrong word for it. Comic Based. artists, comic Based. artists. <laughs> chiaroscuro is the exact opposite of what Frank Miller does. Chiaroscuro means an image that has a full range of values creating a naturalistic look. Modeling. Frank Miller's work is highly tenebristic, which means strong contrasts of light and darks. I it drives me fucking nuts that people call that kind of work on the left of that page chiaroscuro. That's exact opposite of chiaroscuro. Okay, rant over. <laughs> I I I I it was so puzzling to me the first time that I encountered that in print. I was like, did anybody read this? <laughs> and everyone says it. Oh, Frank Miller's high chiaros. And then it's just everyone in comics when they talk about work like that, they say it's chiaroscuro. No, chiaroscuro is a full like fully shaded drawing. That's what it means. That's tenebrism. Okay, <laughs> we've corrected the art, comic art. <laughs> We were talking about uh, Musha, and obviously this is derived in that same sense, like fourth generation uh, Musha. Uh, Dave told me that this style of lettering right here, you know, he had a uh, a sample book of uh, Letraset tones and fonts, and yeah. uh, he would use this sample book to give him <laughs> inspiration for this stuff. And so this is based on a Dutch painter's font. Uh, I'm not going to remember this guy's name off um, the top of my head. It's something like Arnold Brooks or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, he used the sample book as a guide uh, when he was putting it together. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes he would photocopy tones from the sample book, <laughs> like, you know. And I like that he's photocopying them, like, fuck going and buying a sheet of this. I'll just photocopy right. <laughs> and then cut and paste it. That's amazing. 
and that Art Noir Vaux border. Yeah, I mean, that's all in the the uh, Billy Graham poster art of the time, uh, like the Fillmore in San Francisco, all those screen prints. And look at that. There's some uh, there's some Gene Day Star Wars, but goddamn, there's does some... it look like some Al Williamson Star Wars. Right. We have some Gene Day uh, Kiroskuro here. Uh... <laughs> If you just skip to this part of the video, go back and learn why what I just said is wrong. Yeah, um, please. Uh, point worth pointing out: Gene Day didn't have any reference for this portfolio at all. He didn't, you know, this was not an official yes. thing. Um, and G Gene Day, if people don't know, was Dave's like mentor, mentor and really his best friend. And and he, that was where he got all of that was his master class in comics was, was right. hanging out with Gene Day, working side by side with him. Um, mm -hmm. and and so gene advertised this gene day's star wars george lucas film is saluted in this portfolio by science fiction fantasy comics artist gene day featuring eight plates of characters and scenes from the world's best of film uh lucas film and their lawyers did not feel saluted by this uh, advertisement yeah. <laughs> he hadn't checked with them first no oh, no no so shit. they were uh they got a cease and desist um you know, the friendly type of cease and desist that you get before you get the nuclear option. Um, well, but, but this is good name. evidence of what you were talking about. This is a band of buddies just like striking out and doing just you just do your thing and you're not educated in the ways of the world yet. Right. Exactly right. And uh, and so they found out uh, pretty quick when Lucasfilm's lawyer sent them a uh, a little note that said, uh, you're going to destroy all your portfolios uh, and you're going to send us any money that you've made and oh, you're going to do all those things right now. <laughs> wow. <they> said, okay. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Lucas. Um, That's too bad. It's a beautiful drawing. It, it is. And it, it's funny, you'll occasionally hear people knock these, you know, because of course they didn't destroy every portfolio and there are a handful of them out there. Um, and what those people who are nuts don't realize is Gene Day literally drew this whole portfolio without a single reference. He would go to the film and he would watch the film and try to memorize the transitions and he would make sketches while he was watching the film. Um, wow. this, is not, this is not Al Williamson being supplied with, uh, you know, as many screen shots or whatever as he wants, or headshots and everything uh, as reference while he's working, you know, on the Star Wars uh, <clears throat> What do you call the, the Star Wars uh, comic strip? This is somebody I mean, who loved the film and drew it while he was watching it. <laughs> yeah, and like, uh, I mean, filtered through like a webcam and then through Zoom shitty compression, it looks like an Al Williamson drawing yeah. to me. Yeah, uh, that, no, that he did a great job. Is great. Yeah. Um. So, and then we have um. You know other Canadian comic books available and you get a little bit more of an idea of what, what it was going on here. They're selling copies of Oktoberfest, which was done by Dave Sim and Gene Day. Um, they're instructing people to order from now and then books, fog city comics. Number one, funny animal comics featuring art by Rand Holmes has a PO box. You can order from Fantasia, which is a superhero comic that, uh, Dave had contributed to. And, um, something called Arik Khan, number one, which I've never heard from, but he lists another Queen Street or a Queen Street address in Toronto mm -hmm. um, as, as the place you could get it. So uh, when I say like the sort of clubhouse mentality, that's the type of thing that I'm talking about uh, with yeah. this. And it's, it's all just like, like Cerebus striking out into this kind of wild frontier of we're all doing this ourselves and it seems synced up. So quick teaser. You'll notice I have two copies of Cerebus number one. This right here is a bootleg. Yes, Cerebus number one was bootlegged. This bootleg was produced by a naughty group of bootleggers in 1983 and sold directly to comic stores. These bastards made this and carried copies individually to comic stores and sold them. And um, we know who did it. We know who did it, and we're going to tell you all about it, and we're going to show you the FBI's notes on the matter. Uh, or more specifically, Denny Lubert's notes about her call to the FBI. 
and uh, we're going to solve that mystery for you next week. I think next week. Yeah, we'll see. In, a, in a later episode. After I've consulted with my lawyer. Yeah, we need that like uh, CSI. Doom, doom. <laughs> that little every time they do a transition on that show. OK, we're going to take a look at if we do this one video once a month, it'll take us as long to do this as it took Dave. <laughs> So let's do one more. There's another, uh, to me, what looks like Daredevil, um, the Ronin era Frank Miller, but like this quite cover a right bit. here is a knockoff of a Jim Steranko. Okay. Uh, uh, a Nick Fury uh, cover. Is that rendering style from that too? It's the rendering style on that that demon face that really strikes me as what I see. I believe so. A, okay. Uh, I'll um, I'll, I'll pass it off to you and you can tell me what you think. I'll, uh, I'll yeah. I don't know. I I I'll admit that like prior to this, you know, there's a lot of artists that I don't, you know, it's like I don't really. I've seen Steranko stuff. I don't know. It's always reprinted so terribly, and I just right. I, I get it. It was cool, but it it doesn't do it for me. So I'm not super educated in where all these looks were coming from. But well, that's where this cover uh, comes from, uh, anyway. And this is, uh, I believe, reminiscent anyway of a Barry Windsor Smith uh, Conan one. Once again, something that um, you know I've just seen bits and pieces of. Uh, we can see that they're already learning a little bit about the process of making a comic. They, this time, they haven't printed the black, <laughs> entirely black with white text. Yeah. On them. They've, they've given, given the printer some relief <laughs> by printing black text on white instead. Um, Which he will continue to push later on. <laughs> he likes right. that white on black. Printed by Moira Press and Fairway Press. And um, they were the printer's for the the first issue as well and it's two and this was his, because one did the cover and one did the interiors this was his local newspaper press. that's right that's cool. uh, and uh this one is a fairly interesting one in terms of uh tone in terms of the reproduction it's so so much better uh in issue two and part of it is because uh I, this might be where he switched to a 30 percent tone mm -hmm. uh the first the first issue not only is this on better paper but the first issue was he, he was using a 40% tone for service. And there are various technical reasons. But basically, the denser that you work, the more you can expect fill in. Uh, and so that 40% tone that he was using really just filled in like crazy. And uh, his line weight is a lot better, at least on these first few pages. This weight is communicating a lot more and doing a lot more of the lifting for him. You got this nice tapered edge to this thick line right here. And speaking about like um, something, I I didn't see it until you laid it out because in the the phone book trade paperback size it it doesn't lay down flat, uh, right. but those tangents we're talking about that diagonal. I read this as two separate panels, but it's one big image just split That's down right. the page as the gutter. Also, Cerebus's shoulder lines right up into the mountain mm -hmm. mountain range up there it creates a peak for the mountains and that creates like this unity for, yeah it's really something else I, it's it's weird how i don't see that stuff until i'm looking at it through like the camera kind of simplifying it it yeah so we, we've talked about this a little bit before but looking at something on a screen is a very different experience than the tactile experience of looking at something individual you know a, pa a panel like this can really just you know drag you right in because all of these cumulative details give you lots of information when you're looking at it on a screen it sort of flattens all that out into a value um well you know. zoom is running some really awful compression and the webcams aren't the best either so i'll, I'll have the book from Menachem for next time um, so we'll get it filmed with the the camera that's a little bit better but there's a lot of on this video a lot of factors making the video <laughs> pretty bad There's some like real Will Eisner stuff there on the next page, the lack of panel borders. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then that is Frank, a... Frank Miller picks up on that in his, his work as well. And this, this is a, an issue where some of the original art that I've seen for this seg segment anyway um, really doesn't yield much more detail than it's already printed. 
just the tone looks better because it's cleaner. Uh, but this was actually a well printed issue. I love the <laughs> there's that little the two panel sequence at the bottom there where like Cerebus is trying. Well, actually, that that whole page is funny that the previous two pages like where they they say you got to fight with the, this string between your mouth and then the guy lifts him up and Cerebus's feet on the previous page. Sean. Right. Uh, a lot of great kind visual of gags. Yeah. And then at the other side of it where Cerebus realizes, okay, once I get my feet on the ground, I can punch him with my nose. Right. Uh, the earth pig snout punch. Yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. This is, a, this is interesting. Uh, he, uh, this is sort of the same thing we're talking about. He embraces the things that he has already set up like, and then this, and then this, he's got a three foot tall, supposedly three foot tall protagonist. And so when he's in combat, <laughs> that means a lot of different things, right? Yeah. That it wouldn't mean otherwise. And so he doesn't, rather than try to like explain those things away, you know, he doesn't give Cerebus stilts or something or make him have an operation so his legs are longer so he can fight, you know? He, he, he uses the things that are already there uh, and, and mines them for... Comedy, really great comedy. Yeah. Here's a similar uh, thing that you were talking about. So, yeah. Um, already focused on lettering as as image uh, that looks fairly horrendous on the screen but um this is a uh, mechanical line burst here so he bought a piece of screen tone that had like a gradient of uh lines uh getting lighter to darker it actually looks really cool on the screen because as you kind of shake the page around it like becomes yeah. animated with the optical illusion right <laughs> when we talk when we talk about moiray this is what we're talking about uh in film this used to be called uh, herring boning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because a herringbone tie had those types of uh, stripes like that. And basically, if you, you, you shouldn't wear one of those on television was the you know, advice because it would just look crazy the entire time. Every time you move, any little motion caused that to happen um, because the resolution of the screen wasn't high enough to resolve uh, the lines. And so you get this crazy motion. It's called herring boning. <laughs> look at the uh the top top right panel again you've got tangents of the shields going down into the mountain below so that whole sh yeah from the middle of that one shield up to the right edge of cerebus shield it makes like a bigger shield that they're chunk chunking down into the right. space below them a great use of uh scale proportion yeah. here uh Later on, when he has more time for backgrounds, and uh, even later than that, when Gerhard comes on, we'll see something like this is will be a real, you know, they'll, they'll take every opportunity to give you the setting. But really, yeah. these figures right here, I mean, you know, you take individual panels, and these are incredibly sophisticated, uh, you know, drawings. We've got this nice movement. And he's here. doing a damn good Barry Smith there already. Mm -hmm. Great clash right here. I'd be interested in somebody who knows Barry Smith stuff more if any of these individual panels are referenced. Because, you know, I, the splash pages are making specific references. He's not trying to get away with something. He's saying, hey, look, Conan, look at this. Um, but then there were other, and, and, he, and he, he uses visual motifs um, that are directly from, especially like the Red Nails period. Um, mm -hmm. But what I'm wondering is if some of these are individual references. I don't think that he did that. Direct um, swipes. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's mostly like design motifs and, and, and sometimes like key images or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I don't think he did like anatomical swipes. That animation on the right page. Mm hmm. Yeah, this right here is a, and once again really sophisticated. The, you can see that this is actually a single image and he's rolling down, and then we swap when he falls into this hole here. And then you get on the turn, you get it again, but it's happening in the black space. And that bottom, one, I think one of the things that really sets out how Dave uses that is the character's always moving through perspective. A lot of people will do those shots like sideways or whatever, but that right. bottom with the Cerebus and then the feet getting cut off and stuff at the bottom, like he, mm -hmm. he's moving forward so well, much. And he's reinforcing that by having the head movement as he's looking around. You know, yeah. he's, he's making sure that he's not going to get messed up here. Uh, and then that carries over into the upper right, has the same thing. He's, he's 
he's moving up and down through the space in a very compelling way. Right. Um, and then on the next, well, not the next page, but on the next flip of the page, you get something that I find absolutely fascinating. And again, like this is dude on num number two, and I, it's going to be hard to describe without being able to point at it. Maybe Sean, you'll, yeah, you'll right. get what I'm pointing at enough to be able to do it. But right. he's managed to show a character make a circular motion. Yeah, he goes back around the back of there in a circular way, but keeps the reading order left to right, left to right. Which Look at this is rotation. Right so, here. Yeah, right because around. he goes back around. So it's one stable image. And the character moves through it in a way that should make like a, a Z pattern if you could see him do it. Uh, but because he's hidden by the back, it, it just becomes two left to right sequences. Like that's so high level comics right there to me. Yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. And you can see why pros uh, were responding to this pros who were exposed to this you know responded to this book really quickly and probably because they were like well i'm gonna use that <laughs> yeah I mean, like that's i i don't i mean no matter what you think about dave sim no matter like if you like comics you should be cribbing from this book i just noticed another tangent to the uh the left side of panel number two runs right down into the sword below it uh on that yeah, right there. No, uh, just go straight oh, down the. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Boom. Yep. Um, and uh, so here is the first appearance of um, faces into the rock. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to discuss the story, I think, some more later. Um, you know, in, in different videos. But but one of the questions that I have uh, on the early reread is whether this is actually so. This design as a design motif, this comes back, but I don't think this is actually this same in world explanation as the later ones the later ones are almost unaddressed uh later on uh in the series these rock head uh things will become a huge um you know por portion of the background design uh, motif and the only real in world ex uh, explanation we have for them is supplied by oscar uh, the character who's like a stand-in for Oscar Wilde, who discusses the Sirenus outlawing paintings of them, and he calls them guffins. But here there are the carvings of the many faces of camp. By the way, the, the plot of the first issues that we flipped through is Cerebus meets up with a couple guys in a bar, and they go to this mysterious tower to get a special jewel, and when they get it, they, they pay him for helping them get the jewel in gold, and then their jewel turns into a walnut. Right, and he walks away with the gold. In this one, he's out fighting the guys in the snow, and then he falls into this this temple, and there's these carvings of the many faces of Cam. But that name Kim, you're right, that doesn't come back. K H E M. Uh, well, yeah. No Latresserus for his age. His hands pass over carvings representative of the many faces of Cam. Winking lights follow him, and he's as he goes like small enough text. They pose no threat, so the Ardvark ignores them. Um, so the idea that these are all carvings that somebody has made is not really a plausible explanation for the later ones. Um, but we can kind of come. And the like deity chem doesn't ever come back, does it? Right. Yeah. But but on the next page, you see like this is this is the enemy for the whole. This is it, it's such a. It's another one of those things where I don't think he had had it, but it's the Eye of Terum, which is the most precious of the five spheres of the gods. Now, the idea of the five spheres of the gods doesn't come back, but the circular glowing void, right, <laughs> which turns out to be a succubus, right, which is like the female demon that sucks the male's energy, right? right. Like, that is like part of the controversy around Dave is the idea of the female void. Um, and this, uh, there's always these glowing balls that show back up too. So, right. And the molten core of the earth being a fine example of a glowing ball. 
and uh, and uh like in one of the few mythology he, he has a couple of different creation myths and the the void that's then split is this same image so this is like a kernel that he picked up on, on and it, it became everything yeah this, this we, we get some aspects of this that that are also from a from a formal perspective a rendering perspective pretty rad use of the toothbrush huh yeah we got and the painting where it's like swirling around like he's got a brush and he's swirling some mm -hmm. light around it yeah and it's so this it's the eye of terim t-e-r-i-m which is the female instantiation correct i i believe it's pronounced terim um, terim and yeah with the e is the female and the a is the male you got him okay yep. yeah so it's the eye of the female and then that turns on the next page into the succubus and super right. cool uh like little spirally designs there too dna yeah and this is a uh, i mean as as primal a distillation of the themes that you get in a visual image uh in the early in the early issues and that surfing that surfing one up top is a, a common visual Mm -hmm. like the motion across panels but like it has this flow of water that's something that comes back um and then and then you get cerebus moving uh, uh, out of the panels actually he breaks out of space a little bit there right um, but the ball and the, and the ball is like actually bouncing on it looks like it's bouncing off the panel mm -hmm. uh, and he turns he, he gets darker as he goes down here yeah he goes to his 40 percent tone from the first issue here um but yeah i mean i just love this these these white cutouts in the black there uh this is a these are pages that i would just i would kill to get scans of the original artwork oh because all that little toothbrush batter you can tell it's all over that like demon there yep. on the bottom left right like it's on the face and it just doesn't show up so top right too there's there's stuff going on there that just doesn't show up so this um, he would have done the black spatter with the toothbrush with the uh, ink. You just take it. And you, well, we can do a demonstration at some point. Yeah. You can put some ink on there and you rub the toothbrush in there and you get the first few spatters are too big. So you want to get those off to the side and then you kind of. We call that a the poor white. man's airbrush. Right. Exactly what Gerhard called it. Yeah. And then you have the white um, in the same and, and some of these in the same image. So like this one would have had white spatter and black spatter and my god the difference between the the spatter when reproduced from the original artwork with you know my production techniques like you can see it in volume one when you see the full restored 2018 edition um there's a few pages of the sump thing issue issue 24 or 25 that i had original artwork for and man it's just gorgeous and you can see why he didn't do it all the time because it didn't come out right <laughs> uh camera is not capable of resolving those small dots and making him, you know, go to the negative. And and I like that that you get to see him growing as an artist. Like he's figuring out what does and doesn't work for the reproduction of the time. Right. That's that's smart. Uh, you know, something else I just noticed is like he didn't cut the screen tone for Cerebus right to Cerebus's head. No. And yeah. that's I that's like in, intentional. It's not just laziness. It's like his essence is getting sucked into this thing a little bit. Right. Like she's and she's trying to steal his his essence, his soul. Like she's trying to steal the Aardvark's very soul. The tentacles it, reach out. Th this is something that's going to come back uh, later too as a theme of the book. But um, one of the things that uh, you know this connects to later on in the series is the idea that he is not just yeah so in in this sense maybe this original visual representation is his soul being sucked out to this to the succubus demon uh but there's there's an additional layer when you think about the later uh books that make arguments that essentially he's almost like a host to something that yeah. he as a person has this sort of special thing that he's a host to and the idea that that could be abstracted from him and then that's shown with the tone like that. That's more right. than just like uh, coloring him in. It's representing something else. Right. And, uh, you know, you, there, there are other times that, you know, I don't want to get too, 
too much into it, especially if people are reading this <laughs> concurrent with their first read, uh, yeah. which I know at least one person is. Hi, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Matt. Um, and uh, yeah, we have this, you know, great image right here. And then at the bottom, he's, it looks because he set you up with so many of these uh, animated motions across a single background in this like up and down undulating pattern that he does. Um, you're, you're used to that. And so you kind of read across it as smoothly as if it is a single image, but it's really flip flopping back front, yeah. back front. Uh, but it has that same, it just works so fluidly. It doesn't feel discombobulating like dramatic camera switches can in comics. Um, like we were talking to Brandon recently, uh, it won't have aired by the time we've done this, but Brandon was talking about training your audience, um, you know, in, into right. recognizing certain things. And I think he's trained the audience by this point to, to accept that kind of visual motion. And that allows him more freedom with where he places his camera when he wants to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, notice that all the dead are skeletons now, and he has, freed the souls those those warriors that he was fighting at the beginning were undead warriors and you know it's the site of the day's battle corpses are gradually being covered by drifting snow incongruous skeletons visible amid the Bor um, borealan dead which white-eyed warrior were you mutters Cerebus. he thinks of all the souls that have been freed this night how many have fallen prey to the succubus's deception how many other soulless warriors have crumpled into skeletons? How many others are at last resting in the new fallen snow, no longer in mindless fl uh, flight, no longer destroying all in their path? The moon rises as service exits the Borealan Valley. And that's, that's the kind of thing where it's like, you can't call this straight up parody because the stories are legitimately compelling on their own they're well written on their own they have their comedic moments like when he's fighting the guy and he punches him with his nose right but it's not just a series of jokes like it is its own story it's a little silly that it's this aardvark guy but there, yeah it's not really parody is not the right word yeah i don't know what to call it but it, interesting little uh not only here do we get the figure moving across here we actually have a corpse <laughs> across the panel that's not moving oh you uh, know and i think matt dow was the first person that pointed out that for the first however many issues um service always walks away as a silhouette yeah and that the the first time that doesn't happen line i forget what it was we'll see it when we get there but it's like around issue 12 or something the first time it doesn't happen is like really kind of shocking Another moment of like, without even thinking about it, Dave is like training you on, on like what the end of a Cerebus book is. And then mm -hmm. 12 like issues a later breaks that. Yeah. The, the, the structure so far has been like a Western motif, like uh, the here, you know, a uh, stranger comes to town. Yeah. And um, uh, interesting with this tone here on the mountain and everything like that, um, that's, you know, we've got these white borders to, the time but then we have these little strips of tone going across the border on the bottom and do, uh, presumably do you know if dave was seen any manga uh no not not at all not at all at you point. know for a fact that he wasn't or you just fact. yep because yeah. it's so there's so much tezuka in all of this yeah well people with the same tools you know uh, working with some of the same concerns no, and he no, he hadn't seen any manga uh, at this point. I think it would be virtually impossible uh, for him. Well, um, it's it, just it's just you're, it's like people working with the same tools, but those are it. It shows you how high level he was right out the gate. That right. working with the same tools, he came to the same like god of manga <laughs> conclusions. <laughs> it's like that's why like you got to hold this guy in the highest regard in terms of a comics genius is right now he, as, he was as, figuring this all out without I'll, seeing someone else doing it right <laughs> and and he the book wasn't monthly yet but he was drawing it as if it was a monthly book so he would take off a month and do freelance stuff and things like that he would make each issue as if it was a monthly production and then there'd be a month gap 
And this continued for the first few issues that were bi-monthly published. Um, and, you know, he's also a genius at time management. You can see, you know, had he yeah. had more time, he probably would have fleshed this out and really gone nuts with the corpses and made this a really gruesome thing. Um, but he lets the snow do a lot of the work for him, including the very nice service silhouette here. Well, in the pages um, of black, like Cerebus is always kind of having a fight in a totally dark room and it makes the right. book very visually dynamic, but it's also a time saver. And, and the, the other thing is how many other black and white, like good black and white comics would he have had access to in America? It would be mostly colored stuff, right? So he's having yeah. to solve the issue of making good, like in Japan, the entire tradition is making things work in black and white. Right. Dave was solving that problem mostly without any precedent, right? Well, I mean, he, it, the fan, fanzine culture is the, or, you know, zine culture and uh, sort of underground press stuff would have been the precedent in terms of black and white stuff, but also um, Erie and um, some of the other horror magazines that were publishing at the time, uh, many of which he submitted to and occasionally he was uh, successful in selling a story or selling a um, art job uh, to them. But yeah, like uh, I don't remember the exact names, Eerie and Creepy, and there's a few others. Um, Those were printing were... in black and white. Mad Magazine was that out? That would have been mm -hmm. black and white. Okay, yeah. I guess there. It's just like a lot of the stuff that he's referencing seems like Marvel and DC and mainstream stuff that's in color. So yeah, I right. guess there is. I always think yeah, of those as colored, though the eerie and creepy. No, that the, there were there was horror, you know, black and white horror anthologies would have been the main stuff that he could purchase, like you know, right then or okay. whatever the Warren stuff, and that was a market that he was explicitly trying to break into in ninety five or sorry seventy five and seventy six. Okay. Um, so he was, you know, he had a few things published in those things, and then there were like the other. You know, like the ones that are advertised in the back. In fact, um, Toberfest. <laughs> right, right. This is the his his book with uh, him and Gene Day. Is that racist? Done. I don't know. Is that that looks like a Tezuka too? I don't like. It's crazy. He must have seen Tezuka somewhere. I don't think so. I think this is just a joint. Um, you know, like this is an attempt at him and Gene made an attempt to make something that could be sold for this particular event. And I, think I like the, the uh, this shows, I bet, I wonder who did the lettering. Uh, the, they were probably both really good, but the, the, the Pierce Stein Man. for the O. <laughs> and then the letters page here, uh, which has some real ones. And I think um, it might have some fake um, ones as well. If I'm not mistaken, it's Tom Richards, who's the fake letter. Uh, Dave fessed up <laughs> to that at a later date, but uh, there are some real ones. But he's always done that. Like, well, you got to fill out, you know, fill up your your thing. But but it, the the key here is the letter from Frank Thorne. Dear Dave, Cerebus is the best thing I've seen of yours. A very successful parody of the genre and difficult thing to pull off. Your irascible aardvark works perfectly in the context of the book. Blacks are solid, well placed. The technique overall was splendid. Nice storytelling, Frank Thorne. Notice no no um, no t uh, discussion about the anatomy or uh, character consistency because Frank Thorne wants to read more issues and is not stomping down this young guy who's putting out his first comic. Well, that was a damn um, good first two issues. It is. is that a Frank Thorne drawing there? It is. This is a Frank Thorne drawing. It says, Cerebus, did I ever tell you that you remind me of a certain Sumerian aardvark I once knew? Good luck, Dave, from Sonia and Frank. And then, and then you go back a page and you see that Dave, Dave, took, Dave got excited about that. Yep. <laughs> He's like, I've got permission now. That's uh, right. So I'm going to say thank you in issue three and make fun of Red Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and, and complain about her bra. Song of Red Sophia. And yeah. this is done in a parody of the Red Sonia uh, lettering. And that, that ha is already a super Dave thing to do, which he's getting from eerie and creepy that like right. uh, that hatching coming up from the bottom. But that that's a very he still does that. And yeah, so, you know, we're going to talk more about the story 
on future ones, I think. I think part of, you know, my interest in these first two issues is sort of dispelling the myth that they're terrible. Um, and not only are they incredibly entertaining, um, not only is the drawing way better than you remember, especially if you can either get the original issue or get the 2018 remaster. Do I say this enough? Should Which I'll remastered. have next time. We'll see it next time. It's on, it's Re on the way. It's in the mail. Remastered edition right on the top. Um, I did the whole book, uh, me and Mara Sedlins. It took us forever because we were working uh, <laughs> fairly extreme uh, conditions to, you know, like limitations in terms of what our source material was. But Dave sent me all of the office copies that him and Denny had kept around. I basically got the worst physically worst copy at my request of the ones that they had kept of all the original issues. And that's what I worked from when I was restoring them. And um, it was a, you know, a really interesting experience and uh, really taught me a lot uh, about it. And, and it's stunning to look at it and to see the difference uh, between that and previous reprints, which were really suffering uh, the multi-generation thing. And, and, you know, we've talked about this before, but reproduction really does matter. It matters in terms of your assessment of the artist and how you evaluate somebody instead mm -hmm. of a cumulative random fill in of details you actually get to see the thing as it was when they when they did it and uh, or closer to how it was when they did it and you get a really interesting uh things this cover right here uh another betraying sort of dave's uh technique at the time um he you know did all the separations himself so like he said this is the yellow plate and he you know, filled that in. And he said, this is going to be the, I'm not sure if he used like an orange here, or if he used a warm red, but this is going to be the X color. And he went through and filled that in and made the tone, used a gradient tone sheet uh, mm. and put that on there himself. Oh. Uh, you know, uh, same with the magenta. There's like a magenta um, halo of the black on the demon face. Uh, we mentioned before, this is a Steranko takeoff. Loving's Tarenko takeoff. Um, yeah. But, you know, you can see some of the crudity in terms of how he did this. So, like, his tone sheet ripped in half and he just pasted it back on. <laughs> <laughs> and so you get this kind of line going through it. But, you know, this is what you do when you just, this is the sort of put on a play spirit that but he's embodying. It's here. Like, all of that stuff is so forgivable because of the, strength of composition and design and use of the form it's like right. i read this for the first time in this like i said when we talked to Callie and i heard about cerebus and i said i'm not buying any of it until it's done but so i didn't get a copy until uh probably 2004 is when I went to a shop and bought this 10th printing and it's absolute garbage. And never once did I think this is a bad comic. I thought, Oh my God, this thing is like as amazing as I'd hoped it would be all along. And it's just purely on the strength of it as a comic. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, even if it was absolute garbage, surface technique it's such a good comic and it's not garbage surface technique and even through the shit printing i could see that it's not garbage i, th I think that he um, i think that he his essays that he wrote which were very illuminating uh when these were first collected you know that he wrote in swords and things like that um he was like nakedly honest about his limitations as an artist and the way that he developed and things like that and i think that while that's beneficial to uh people um reading it in terms of you know learning about his his process and everything like that i think it was actually negative in terms of people's appreciation for the artwork i think it gave people an opportunity to be like oh yeah that is really crude um yeah pe no, that's people true like it's very helpful to the other young artists which was his main goal at right. the time was encouraging a an entire like uh swelling of people doing it themselves and in encouraging people to get into it and do their own thing like he was yeah at the expense of the assessment of his own work potentially right so it's just this sort of a diy aesthetic to it uh you know do it literally do it yourself um you know the fact that he literally hand colored the separations uh himself without knowing about any screen angle and stuff like that it's uh, awesome 
<laughs> well, and I, I think the other thing that I would like to set up now for my assessment, because I have the totality of it kind of as a structure in my head. This becomes, I know we're saying this starts as a group effort, but this becomes one man's search for truth. Right. Um, and I think it's very important for people to realize that Dave was a high school dropout, right? Um, but obviously a genius level human being and a massive autodidact. I think that he and Frank Zappa are two of the greatest autodidacts who have lived and deported themselves. Uh, yeah. Both, both of them masters at assessing something and gaining competency or mastery of that, of that thing in a period of time that other people would be shocked at. I think people would be shocked to know that politics of high society is informed by Dave going and checking out every book on um, po politics at the Kitchener Library and reading them all. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I don't know how to say that without <laughs> sounding hyperbolic, but it's not. Like, it's, it's not hyperbolic. Like, Dave Sim is to comics what Frank Zappa was to guitar. Both of those people um, had tremendous advantages because of their their self-taught nature and both of them frankly had had things that reveal the self-taught nature as well and, yeah um and which, i think which, that's important to set up for like as you go through like where dave started and where dave wound up one of the things that fascinates me about that arc starts here is you can see already this guy. How old was he? 20? 20. 20. Um. <laughs> uh, wh whatever. He was a young yeah. dude that had dropped out of high school. I, I think and pretty much from the time that he had dropped out of high school, no one ever told him how to do anything. And he did it his way. And he figured out a way to make that work. And tracking the path of a genius who never encounters no yeah. is impossibly rare and you know i know there's a lot of like hey dave's crazy he's bananas like i mean we both work with him we have some stories where we could write it off as the dude is a nut job but my thing is, is like people are always trying to like diagnose him with what does he have or something like that and it's like i don't know that that's the right way to do it this is a genius level person who has never been told no and has been able to use that massively powerful mind uh to like create a fictional world view and like I, I can't emphasize that enough as we go forward that that's what we're tracking is the development of a mind like that in the public eye in response to the public eye and using the response from the public as part of the experiment yeah um and and we're going to see that in a lot of different modalities uh you know we're going to see that in the visual rendering we're going to see that in the anatomy we're going to see some of that in the storytelling and you know his writing and his prose style and organizational system and all different types of things but um, just taking the drawing for a moment um, the, the most best quote i ever saw about this and the thing that stuck in my head um, is something that tim Kreider wrote in his essay for the comics journal 300 and he said uh, when when the series started out dave sim was the best the second best artist at your high school uh, the guy that you would tag to um to uh, paint, paint something on your van or something like that, you know, um, and 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 it's interesting. That's that's the percept perception, the second best artist at your high school, um, at, because because you know, I, I I'm not, I'm not saying that I agree with that quote. Uh, yeah, I I entirely disagree. <laughs> I I I I think that that quote is inform misinformed about. Sort of, I think that that quote is misinformed about sort of what the reality is of working 
1977 with no budget um, and no reference to things like a pull file or books that we have or take advantage of today or Google image search or any of the other things that like a up and coming artist uses to crush uh, nowadays. However, I think that it is sort of indicative of the general view, oh, hey, this guy started off really low and got really high. Now, I think it's actually a function of speed. I think that uh, this is a Dave who's trying to learn, like, how do I do this thing in a three week period? You know, how do I draw a whole comic in three weeks? I've got to do a page a day, right? So, sorry, this face sucks, but I got to draw the next one. Um, and and um, we'll, we'll, we'll do a separate video at some point where we look at some of the pre Cerebus uh, Dave artwork and we can pinpoint a few things. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think it was a function of speed. You know, he got more and more consistent at the speed that he had set for himself. But um, he's maybe the, to... he's maybe the second best artist out of every high school in all of North America in a four year span or something like, like the best kid at your high school is not that sophisticated with negative space and design. And that's a, that's a garbage statement. Well, it's, I, I think it's a statement that's, that's almost entirely reliant on like anatomical stuff and not a, a acknowledgement of the deep and sophisticated surface level pin you shit that's right. like not like you're you're not talking about comics you're you're talking about illustration at that point like which right. is like why the fuck are you writing for comics journal and not illustrated weekly or something well you know he's a cartoonist who turned into a prose novelist so um, um but uh, and i think he's an excellent prose writer um but an assessment of a visual artist not not the best um that particular take but the, yeah, the, the thing is, is that like, if someone could go visit 1977 Dave and give him a drop off of, of a bunch of nibs and say, hey, look, here's five seconds of me drawing with this, use this instead. <laughs> and the thing is, he got that, like he got that at shows. This service issue was a hit. I mean, it sold, right? They all sold out, they made new issues. And then he was going to conventions and he was meeting other pros and somebody like Marshall Rogers came up to him and was like, Hey, uh, let me show you something. <laughs> wow. Rogers is, is like, you do it this way. And then he's like, Oh, well, well, well thanks, Mr. Batman. And then immediately put it to yeah. fantastic use, like no learning curve at all. You just, he just needs to know it's an option. It's right. like, don't, <laughs> I can't, I can't wait to talk about those covers. You don't use watercolor <laughs> like oil paint. Like you don't blob it on there. It's, you're supposed to put water in it. That's like that's a yeah. That that's yeah yeah. I challenge anyone else to pick pick shit up that quick and and to use the things that wrong and still come out with a pretty good image. You know, right? Something very uh, you know it, 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 the autodidact thing. Uh, I, I I really I, I I'm glad that you brought that up. And this first talk, and uh, just just so we're clear on the language, autodidact literally means self-taught. And uh, there are, it's interesting that it's almost a pejorative at this point. We live in an age of accreditation, where everything is signed off on. You know, you don't you don't just get into a car and drive it. You go to the DMV, and they give you this sort of you know you, you have to demonstrate all these different things that you know our, our age of accreditation almost looks down on auto uh, but there was a time in which that was outside of a guild system that was the way that you learned you know uh, and i think that there are weaknesses that sometimes come out of uh, self-training like that uh, but for all those weaknesses when the right person hits something you get something completely unique you know well and and some of the like okay alan moore high school dropout autodidact no one's sitting around saying that's a stupid uneducated no. like illiterate poorly read man you know uh I, we both have degrees but your successes as a pre-press guy are entirely self-taught yeah. like you're not sitting there crediting wherever you went to school <laughs> I didn't learn anything in school. I'm sorry to tell you. I can't say I didn't learn anything at school. You know, I have like 
a pretty thorough background, but it was the autodidact that I brought to those institutions that made me who I am. Most of the people I know who aren't autodidacts that went through those, you know, they're not going to contribute anything significantly interesting. At best, they will be a really good scholastic who's really good at following the rules. Well, your professor's not holding your hand or holding your brush while you're, while you're putting in your hours. Well, they want us to these days. Because the autodidact is, as much as they talk about it, they don't actually want you. Or they want you to do it, but they won't give you the... I won't go into that. I was doing some some uh, how to be a teacher, teacher training last night. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry for you. Sorry yeah. for your loss. They, they, want you, they, they want you to let everyone do everything on their own, but then they won't let you. Yeah, it is. It's it's something that I think is devalued these days is the self-taught person and that everyone needs a college degree. And if you don't have a college degree, well, you're not going to contribute. But. Right. And and people act like it's nutty to think that a diversity of opinion or a diversity of thought is is positive. You know, pe- people like just as a for instance, like Dave Bible commentary. You know, well, OK, well, I guess all the Quran scholars are wrong. And it's like he's given something new, he's brought something new to this conversation by virtue of being unsoiled by opinions. He doesn't have a rabbi that's sitting over him. This, this, this means this, you know, don't do that that way. You know, he doesn't have somebody telling him no. You know, he has the, the virtue of a clean slate is that sometimes you, you bring something new to the conversation. I don't know. And, 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 some, and that is well worth having sometimes that leads to like some things that you're uncomfortable with or you think this is totally bananas but i don't think it's crazy it's it's just an opinion that's informed so far outside of the system that the system doesn't know how to adopt it but it's not just like he came to these random conclusions he came to these things by reading the entire section in the library by always doing research by running experiments in the book, seeing how the public responded to them. It's just not the normal way people collect their data. And so that when the conclusions are stuff that we all like are like, whoa, um, you know, I, I think people need to understand that because that's something I admire so much is this is a dude that dropped out of high school and only ever did it his own way, which is like should be the dream for an artist. Like no one ever told me no. I mean, it's bad. It's not good to never have a constraints put on you either. I think that's a lesson that will that I have taken from working with Dave is there's some dangers in that. Like it's good to have some constraining factors. And and he really has not because he's been able to set up his world. But he's he has been able to fund living that way too, which is like, who the hell else has ever pulled that off? Which is, I mean, like that's insane and should be applauded. So, uh, I, yeah, I really, I, I think these these early issues are fantastic. There, I, I actually lamented when some of this vibe went away in Cerebus. So, I think everyone should start at the beginning. Let, let me just say one more time, um, uh, for, for for the record, uh, that reading. Dave's monthly et- editorial that became the guide to self-publishing. Uh, I read this as a sophomore, I think, in high school. Uh, they were coming out. I, I'll have to look at the actual dates to see exactly when I read it. One of the most influential things I ever read, uh, read him talking about, you just do it. You do the thing, you're going to do it bad. Just do it, and after a certain amount of time, you'll be less bad. And you know what? If you want to learn about something, you just go and you read about the thing. You watch other people doing the thing. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how influential that was uh, personally. And, you know, it's one of those things that I'm always going to be grateful to him for giving me that attitude. And he was able to impart that in a, you know, a casually written monthly essays. Um, I, I remember the advantage I had or other people, like, you know, writing research paper. My first research paper was in, in college or something like that. And all these people are, you know, not sure what to do. And I knew exactly what to do. I went and I read seven biographies of George Orwell. 
uh, in a row. And then I sat down and I wrote my research paper. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> well, and I, it's, it's something that I so hard try and impress upon my students and, and, and people um, that I stay, people who I think are very talented, who I stay in touch with afterwards but it's so hard to get them to like, hey, make that first page and put it on Instagram. Hey, just make that first comic. They'll sit and they'll plan and they're will build and they'll character sketch and they're amazing, but they don't ever make an actual product. I hate this and in Instagram and stuff, I think like kind of celebrates amazing sketchbook artists. Right. It's amazing. And I guess on Instagram, that counts as doing something. You have 70,000 followers or whatever, and, and you can monetize the sketchbook. But like, you want to tell the story, start telling the story. Well, I'm not good enough yet. You will, if you wait until you're good enough, you will never be good enough. Yeah. Like if you waited to where you were ready to be a parent, yeah, you would never have the kid. You got to have the damn kid and figure it out, right? And yeah. I cannot get students to do it. That just people won't do it. No matter how much you tell them this is the route, they won't do it. The only option is listen to what Dave is saying here. Listen to what we're saying. Do the fucking first page. Put it on Instagram and tell people you're going to do one every two weeks afterwards and make yourself publicly accountable. Or if you don't want to put it uh, on Instagram, make a photocopy of it and put it on the light pole uh, outside of your, your dorm room. Uh, and then update it by adding a new one to the light pole every day uh, or every every week or something. I mean, you know, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't have to be on the internet to be real, uh, but it has to be in front of someone to be real. Well, the idea is public accountability. Right. Put it out there in a way that you're now accountable to fans, right. and you got to stick with that thing. And like Dave did, do the first issue. Don't tell your whole story. I don't care. I just watched Dune. That's a fucking terrible movie. Like, don't make Dune. Don't spend 10 minutes telling me about the political system. Tell me a nice story and have some of that shit scattered around and let it develop. You know, like, that's that's another lesson uh, take from him. So, yeah, I think that's that's important. And I, uh, I will I'll, one more thing I'll, I want to say before we leave. If people want to pick up Cerebus and read it, um, Sean's remasters are amazing. You got to go buy the remasters. I'm, I'm going to say something controversial, though, too. Also, and may, I don't know, maybe we can provide this. Go download the whole series in scans of the issues. Because that stuff's not reproduced and you can't get it any other way. And I think that it's important to understanding the series. And I don't know how that would be available or where it would be available. I first read Cerebus through Torrance. I stole that shit on. Well, no, I, I had like six volumes of it that I had bought. Uh, but I read it through Torrance when I read it all through. And the back matter was so important to me. So I'm not saying steal Dave shit. Go buy the remastered versions. But if there's a way to get like Sean has in the original versions and see the letters and stuff, I think that's so important. Well, once you get past... Uh the first 45 or issues or so they're dirt cheap on ebay uh, it's, you know they had a huge audience then and have a fairly small audience now and so you can buy the individual issues for less than a dollar a piece uh, i would i would highly recommend getting the actual physical original issues if you can uh, yeah. but yeah buy the remastered to read them um volume one like i said has the remastered logo on the top that's the 2018 edition that's the one that mara and i did together did the whole thing and well worth reading in that form and also if you can get the individual issues after about issue 40 or so you can get them for less than a dollar a piece well yeah the the reprinted collections are going to be it's going to look the best and it's it's going to look as amazing yep. as it can but there is a component of what the thing was that is not collected um that i think is important and that's why i say i know it's controversial to say you know download things or whatever but if, you, if that's just like as a but even if it i don't know maybe we should talk to dave about releasing just the digital yeah. back matter collection or something I, um, I, dave has said before um he, he you know he wrote before that if, if the only way that people can do it if they don't have the money uh, they should download service and read it and uh, he's fine with that uh, but that he would appreciate money when you can uh yeah and you know if you buy if you buy 
each of the remastered volumes, I think you wouldn't mind uh, if you also read the, you know, Backmire online. But like I'm saying, you can buy them for less than a dollar a piece. Yeah. Per issue, so also an option. Um, but uh, gosh, thanks for listening to us yammer about this. And for so long. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have uh, quite a discussion for you next week um, about the sordid tale of the bootleg comic. And I don't know anything about it, so I'm going to be like sitting here too, like FBI. Wow. Right. Part of re part of the reason that um, we're not doing it right now is because, um, as you can see from my from my stubble, uh, I'm a little worn, worn a little thin right now, and um, I, I didn't get Carson all the stuff in preparation for this uh, talk. Uh, but yeah, we have uh, Denny's uh, notes. We have a forensic analysis that I did of the two issues side by side, um, and we have. Uh, Dave's reveal of uh, who the chief suspect uh, was and uh, how it fits in with the uh, available information. And so, yeah, <laughs> I look forward to it. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be with the audience on that one. Excellent. Uh, All right, everyone. For, thanks, thanks so for much for joining and, us. Um, Strange Death, Alex Raymond is going to be in comic stores on November 10th, and it's going to be speaking of Dave Sim. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be in bookstores um, either November 16th or November 23rd, depending on the bookstore. And um, it's going to, if you supported our Kickstarter, it's going to be, I don't know. Uh, it's supposedly coming to my house tomorrow, 700 copies of the book. Are you going to do a uh, live stream? No, but I, I don't know. I mean, it's. I'm sure that the poor driver who has to figure out how to get 700 copies of a book that's this thick on, into my narrow ass driveway on a narrow ass hilly road uh, will not appreciate a camera. Maybe Tori can film it through the window if she's here. But um, last time I basically had the, when they dropped off just the cardboard boxes, I had to help the guy make sure he didn't kill himself when the pallet took off down the hill because <laughs> he was unloading it out of the back of an 18 wheeler um yeah then i mean we're hitting the uh, a, a pretty clustered point in the semester for me working at three different institutions uh with lots of obligations coming to finals so i'm going to bust my ass to get people's kickstarters to them as quick as possible uh, if i wish the book would have got to us the proper way in july so that the kickstarter people would have got it before everyone else but that's probably not going to happen this time unfortunately because i i sometimes i work 14 hour days so right and you will see office. yeah we'll, we'll both look haggard oh yeah my local post i already talked to them they're i i said i'm i got like 650 packages of this you know i brought them I sent out one uh, prelim uh, strange death book and I said, I have 650 of these. How are we going to do this? And they were like, Oh Jesus. And I said, bring it to the back. Don't bring it in the front. So it, we'll, we'll see. We might break the Alabama postal system. And if you do, <laughs> uh, this is the first place you'll hear about it. So yeah, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, check out our uh, Patreon. Uh, you know, if you, if you like what we're doing, please consider supporting us. Uh, even in a three dollar tier a month, uh, it's a huge effort. Uh, every hour that we're doing this is hour that uh, you know we're not doing other work, and um, we really like doing this, and would like to be able to continue doing this as often as we can. Uh, so, if you're enjoying it, please do uh, chip in if you're able, and if you're not able, um, please share the link and let people know that you think we're doing uh, valuable things. And thanks for watching. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good one. What's the audience books? Smash. And you get them!